Experiencing God's favor is more than getting goodies. There's surprise, power, and even... So we're continuing Christmas. We started Christmas, or at least looking at the Christmas story, experiencing God's favor. And we're doing some parallel stuff on the Wednesday night service. But Christmas does have to do with Jesus. Not Santa, not something else, Jesus. Imagine if you got a travel, and congratulations, you got an all expense trade trip to England. And you're on the airplane, and in the middle of the Atlantic, you have a heart attack. Sounds like fun, huh? No, it doesn't sound like fun any place, does it? But you're on the way to, oh, well, in this case, death, because you're in an airplane, right? And what, what are the stewardesses, or the, excuse me, the, what do they call them now? The flight attendants. What do the flight attendants do? You've seen it in the movies, what do they do? What's that? Is there a doctor on board? And one of the flight attendants says, is there a doctor on board? We have a health emergency, is there a doctor on board? 15 guys put their hands up. 15 guys put their hands up. What kind of doctor are you? We're cardiologists. 15 cardiologists going from London, in this case, to the United States for a cardiology conference. Got up, they decided who was the best of them, and they worked on 67-year-old Dorothy Fletcher from Manchester, England, and saved her life in the middle of the Atlantic with very little equipment after she had a massive heart attack. That's what's called being at the right place at the right time. The right place at the right time. Now, if you're thinking ahead, you've already figured out that Jesus is in the right place at the right time, too, and that's where we're headed. And God has those opportunities for us, though, too. Those, some of us call divine appointments. Where has God led us? To be in the right place at the right time to do what God has for us to do. And there's no better place to be in than that when we're in Christ Jesus. Because that also means we're in God's favor. It doesn't mean it'll always be easy. But God has made places for us to be. Remember one of my favorite passages, I share it with you a lot, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace we save through faith, it is not a works of, lest any man should boast. And God has prepared for us works of righteousness beforehand, right? That's verse 10. That's what we're seeing worked out. Now, if you would, please turn with me to Luke chapter 1. We're going to review that, the account of Mary and Joseph and Jesus, starting in Luke chapter 1, down at verse 26. We'll read this, and then we'll kind of break it apart and look at parts of it. And by the way, I don't say story anymore. I try to say account because there's lots of stories, and usually when we say story, it isn't true. Starting in verse 26, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Not a bright, shining spot, by the way. To a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying. Now remember, angels show up when, in Jewish tradition, angels show up when somebody is about to die. Okay? First shot, angel appears. Second shot, shock, I'm about to die. She's troubled and trying to discern what sort of greeting this may be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid. You know, angels say that a lot. Don't be afraid. Mary, for you have found favor with God. And this is what we're going to be talking about today. Finding favor with God. There's a lot of people who will tell you, just give money today. $1,000 will ensure that you have favor with God. God doesn't work that by, way, by the way. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Uh, Yeshua. Savior is what that means in Hebrew. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary quite rightly said to the angel, 
How will this be since I'm a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth is in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who is called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. So she goes from thinking she's about to die to being told she's going to have the Savior of the nation of Israel, as far as she knows, and that there'll be no man involved. It's going to be directly from God. And God found favor in her. And she says, Okay, I'm there. That's exactly right. According to what you say, I'm your servant. And of course, plenty of things led up to this. You know, no doubt mom and dad had some training in scripture and, and the way they lived. Maybe generation after generation prepared Mary for this. But Mary still had that moment where she could decide, yes, I'll follow. No, I won't. So, let's talk about that. Walking in the favor of God. Mary found favor with God, but we don't know why from this passage. We can find favor with God, too, and it's not like we're looking for something lost. Really, what we're looking for is God, God's work in our life, and willing to go forward with him just like Mary did. Mary didn't know. She said, okay, I'm with you. I'll go where God wants me to go. I'll do what God wants me to do. You know, we can learn from the life of Mary a lot of things. Mary did not get chosen because she lived in Herod's temple, and, or excuse me, in Herod's castle. Probably a very good reason why she didn't get chosen, because she wasn't in Herod's castle. Herod was evil. It was a corrupt and nasty place where very few, if any, who served God existed. She wasn't rich. We don't know that she had great skills. She was probably a teenage girl. We don't know that she was any better or any worse looking than anybody else. We know that she came from kind of a dump of a town. Some of you may feel that that represents life as you know it too. Because we're always looking someplace else for something greater. But God looks at the heart. He knows our lives. And he uses those who are following him to bring about his plans. That is a big part of what it means to find favor. Now in this text, the word is kiss from the Greek. And we get words like charismatic, but we also get words like charity. And that's the same word as grace. So when you see favor, you could say grace. God has found something of value. God is giving something of value. And the reason it's written here as favor instead of grace is because the recipient is the one being referred to. They have received something good. Grace is what is given. Favor is what is received. And favor doesn't come from following a magic formula. That's what so many of the books that you've seen, maybe even read. If you do this, 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 and this, God will give you favor. And then typically, what you see is people tell you that favor is wealth, position, power. Uh, does that reflect anything that you see in Mary's story? Let's see. Um, teenage girl. People want to stone her. Family's probably disowned her. Or they're certainly not happy. The community is unhappy. Part of the reason why she leaves to go visit her cousin Elizabeth, most likely. Joseph has a problem. He's going to divorce her quietly. He's not pushing to stone her. He's a gentle man, a good man, until the angel says, Hey, pal, let me tell you the rest of the story. Okay, God. I'm with you. It's not a magic formula, it's simply faithfully looking to God, seeking what God has, doing what God says. Not some magic set of three rules and a donation to X ministry, as you so often see. God chooses us for roles to play, and whether you like it or not, God chose you to be like you. So if you hate you all the time, you've got a problem with God. But God's favor is surprising. It's powerful and it's demanding, even though it doesn't always make sense to us. 
So let's talk about that. God's favor is surprising. When we look at the beginning of this, it's really surprising, right? When you see him the place. Yes. An angel shows up, right? How many of you have had an archangel show up at your house recently? Just recently, say the last week or two. Nobody? Okay. Yeah, I've never had that myself. Mary has. Not just an angel, Angel Gabriel, the announcing angel, right? Shows up and talks to Mary in Nazareth and says, hey, you're going to have a baby. And what does he say to her in verse 28? Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. Of course, she's troubled, right? Because this is not the norm. She's going, whoa, why are you here? The angel says, wait a minute. Don't worry. It's okay. You are favored. God, we often say God loves you, but this is even more than that, right? Love brings about mercy and grace. Love brings about that grace by which she can be favored. But it doesn't always look like favor. When somebody puts you in a situation where everybody hates you and things just seem to be hard all the time, because remember, this is Mary's life. It's not just when the baby is in her womb. It's not just when the baby is born. Remember, Herod is looking to kill him, looking to kill Jesus. So they have to beat feet off to Egypt, right? They make a run for it. They're fugitives. For years, they're living in a foreign country. Then they come back. And I doubt, with the memories that people have, that it was all that much easier. But at least Herod was dead, and there was no assassins around. And then just think, there must have been strange things that happened. Just like when Jesus, at his bar mitzvah, when he first got to go to Jerusalem, he says, didn't you know I'd be in my father's house? Wait, we missed you for three days. That's a whole other story. Probably not child neglect. We can talk about that elsewhere. But <laughs> three days, you were gone. What were you doing? I had to be about my father's work. Oh yeah, that's right, the angel and stuff. Okay, this should be interesting. Or remember when Jesus has started his ministry and Mary and some of the kids, some of her kids, some of half-sisters and half-brothers of Jesus show up to go, hey, come home. We're worried about you. And Jesus says, my mother and my brothers? Who are my mother and my brothers? Those who follow me in terms of following God. That's basically what he says. And so there were challenging things. And of course, she had to sit there and watch Jesus die on the cross, wondering, was this all a delusion? Did I mistake something here? But God says, you are favored. God has shown you favor. That's surprising. And yet, what's even more surprising is the result. How big that surprise was. Your baby in a dumpy little town to an unwed mother actually saves the world. Amazing. And of course, God's favor is powerful. It's seen in that, right? But remember, what are the Jews looking for? They're looking for somebody to come in and save them from the Romans. Kill the Romans! Some powerful physical leader, some warrior king who's going to come in. Now, Jesus is a warrior king. But this isn't the time that he's going to be there as a warrior king for such a time as this. The right place, the right time. God has brought things together so Jesus can come and pay the price for sin. That's far more dangerous than the Romans ever were or ever would be. And what does God through Gabriel tell Mary? Behold, you will conceive right, in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, and he will be the great he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David. Here are the promises, just like we talked about last week. God is faithful. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. So he's not just human. Multiple pointers here. Son of the Most High. Reign forever. There will be no end to his kingdom. It is Son of God, Son of Man. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I'm a virgin? And the angel goes on to say, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, and therefore the child will be called Holy, the Son of God. Now, the plan is somewhat unfolded for Mary. And the, Mary reminds the angel, hey, a little detail, excuse me, 
Gabriel says, no problem. God will take care of it. And if you look down at verse 37, this is a really good one to remember because we really get locked into our own limited thinking. For nothing will be impossible with God. That's what we read in verse 37. For nothing will be impossible with God. The only thing that's impossible for God is to violate his nature, to be unfaithful, to lie. But really, anything positive, there is nothing that is impossible for God. When God wants to use someone for his purposes, it will often seem impossible. Try to put yourself in Mary's place. Do you think that looked like a great situation? Wow, I feel so favored. Everybody hates me and half the village wants to kill me. Can it get better than this? Oh, wait. They're sending troops to kill my son and maybe me too. Fantastic. Let's go to Egypt. And remember, Egypt is often seen as one of the embodiments of evil and sin. It's not like they're going to the Bahamas, right? And then it just goes on and on. God, where is that favor? She would find out right, in time. But life was hard for Mary. And yet, she facilitated something that was needed by the entire human race. There is a challenge in these powerful movements of God. They often demand a great deal from us. Look ahead, if you would, please. Take a look over in chapter 2, starting at verse 8. This is where the announcement is made later to more folks. And it's probably being made, you remember the story, right? The account. An angel appears, in fact, an army of angels appear to some shepherds outside of Bethlehem. And in Luke 2, verse 8 through 14, gives us that account. Now, likely these shepherds were tending the sacrificial lambs, the sheep that belong to the temple. But we don't know that with certainty. Now look down at verse 10. And the angel said to them, fear not. Like you just, like Gabriel said to Mary, right? Fear not. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And that's the one angel, the spokesman angel. Then look down at verse 14. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. And what the word here is again is charis, grace. God bringing forth, delivering favor. These shepherds were favored. Bethlehem was favored. They're all favored because they're playing their role. And they're included in God's plan. And if you're in Christ, that's you. Even on the days that you don't want it to be you. Because you go, that's costly. Hey, you know, if I share with them, I'm probably going to have headaches. Because they may not receive it. Well, they may. Maybe they won't, right? We often second guess everything that God tends to lead us into. But God says, elsewhere, you are to be salt and light. You are to make a difference in terms of preserving, aiding, enlivening, sharing the truth, even saving through the, sh the work that we're sharing about Jesus and what he's done in our lives and what he's promised to do in the lives of others. God is at work. And think ahead. What does Jesus say? Because we've talked about this being hard. Look over to um, Matthew 25. Keep your finger in Luke 1, though. In Matthew 25, this is towards the end of Jesus' earthly ministry. And he's talking to people. He's talking to his disciples about what will happen in the judgment. He's talking about the final judgment, or one of the final judgments. Jesus is speaking to those who are in him and serve others. I'm having a hard time here. Starts off from chapter 25 with the parable of the ten virgins and then down to verse 31. And when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he'll sit on a throne and he is going to judge, right? Then down to 34. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father. Again, pretty much the same word, charis. 
Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world, for I will be with you. He separated the sheep from the goats, those who are with God and those who are opposed to God. And look what he says. It gets really strange. In 35, For I was hungry, and you gave me food, and I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was, you, I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you? When do we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you a drink? And when do we see a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when do we see you sick or in prison? We, or we didn't do that. You can't give us something for credit that we didn't do. And then in verse 40, and the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to the one of the least of my brothers, you do it to me. That we've talked for months about what John says. But it's throughout Scripture. If you don't love, if you say you love God and don't love His people, you're a liar. You're a fraud. And in fact, it's a very frightening thing because look what it says in verse 41. There'll be those who on the left who tried to look like they were there come to Him and say, well, Lord, we did. No, sorry. Go away from me into eternal punishment. And then he says, the righteous will go into eternal life. None of us can meet all of those needs. And this is the season where we get particularly bombarded, right? With give here, uh, help there. It's the time of year to give. Well, every part of the year is the time of year to give, right? But in Thanksgiving and Christmas, there's more giving than any other time of the year. And so what many of these agencies do is they bombard you now to get enough money for the rest of the year. But we get tired. It's actually called uh, charity fatigue or compassion fatigue. And we look out at the world, even without the advertising, and go, what can I do? It is such a mess. The answer is, you can do something. You can't do everything, but you can do something. If you're doing nothing, that's a problem. Worse yet, if you're doing things for your own glory, but to do nothing for anyone is a problem. God calls us to do something. And often in the kingdom, these powerful things of God come from little things that don't look like much. I mean, look at Paul. Paul was said to be, by church tradition, kind of a squatty body, obnoxious sounding, runny-eyed, um, know-it-all, with a squeaky voice, some traditions say. And yet, God used him mightily. I, I think of Gladys Alward, who, Aylward. Gladys was a sickly, unschooled, little woman, about this big, actually that's a little tall, about this big, who was a maid, in England, but she came to know the Lord. She was following Christ and she kept getting this impression she needed to go to the mission field. And she wanted to go to China. She didn't know anything about China, but as she prayed, that's where God seemed to lead her. And she would go to a mission organization and they would say, sorry, you're sickly and you have no money and you're not schooled. And besides, you're a tiny little woman. What are you going to do? And finally, one day through Clearly, a divine appointment. A letter shows up from a missionary in China. Somebody she didn't even know about. It says, I've heard that you have a heart for China. Would you come help me? I'll pay your way. And so this, this older missionary lady pays her way. She comes out. And you know what? First of all, what does Gladys Albert find when she gets off the boat? She's a little, dark-haired, thin woman. And she's standing amongst thousands of little, dark-haired women and little, dark-haired men. And she actually fits in. And she started wearing the native garb, so she fit in even more. And she ended up helping until this lady died. And then she took over the mission that she was responsible for, mostly to women and children. Many came to know the Lord. She, she rescued kids. She started an orphanage. When the Japanese invaded, she saved hundreds of people 
and God miraculously answered prayer. But it was a little thing. In fact, it was a little woman who was told she couldn't do anything, who did amazing things because God was in it. And it wasn't easy, it was hard, but God was in it. And you know, people go, what about Billy Graham? Okay, what about Billy Graham? Super. I'll give you a better one. What about Billy Graham's Sunday school teacher who led him to the Lord? When do you hear about her and what an amazing Christian she was? About how much she had done, right? Many times we won't see our reward. Many people who are faithful in the little things won't know what God is about until that judgment. And God's favor is demanding. Look at verse 30. Or did I say 30? I think I'm at 38. 38. And Mary said, Behold, I am a servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Let me be God's servant. I am the Lord's servant. May it be as you said. Mary didn't go, Whoa, whoa, uh uh-uh. No, sorry. No, scary. No, no, no. She didn't do that. She doesn't run away. She embraces what God has said. She says, okay. If that's what you want, okay, Lord, I'm your servant. And we see many of these people who are highlighted in the scripture. Queen Esther is another woman, right? There are far more women in the Bible than in any other ancient text, by the way. When you hear people say, God doesn't like women, it's not true. Queen Esther is queen. She has the opportunity, at the risk of her life, to go in and challenge something the king has done, which is to basically promote the genocide of the Jews in his country. And she does it. She worries, but she prays, and she goes. Think about the Good Samaritan. Now, the Good Samaritan may just be a parable, but there were plenty in Scripture and in life who were like the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan isn't looking to make friends with the Jews who he saves. He's not willing to, he's not looking to get rich or to get favor or anything else. He's doing what God would have him to do, right? And that's where you see the big names, Isaiah and Ezekiel and many others. How would you like to be Jeremiah? Jeremiah, I, all I want you to do is just tell people what I have for you to say, and they will hate you and not listen to you and try to kill you. But that's all you need to do. I mean, it's not a hard job. And God used that. You know, and that whole salt and light, right, comes in here. There is an attitude that comes first. Is it us or is it God? Mary says, I am the servant. That word literally means I am a slave to you. Whatever you want, I will do. She doesn't run. She doesn't whine. She doesn't point to somebody else. Remember, even Moses goes, I can't talk. She just said, okay, Lord, I'm with you. And it will cost her for all the reasons we talked about. People trying to kill her and her baby and abusing her and talking behind her back and calling her names. But she persevered because she looked beyond them to God. She looked beyond the lies and the gossip and the evil of people around her and the outright hatred from folks like Herod. And she looked to God and she persevered. And ultimately, she would see amazing things happen because she was also there when Jesus was resurrected. Through her, the world changed. And so as we come to a conclusion, what about the church today? Is that the normal response? I am your servant. I will do what you want. I would say no. Not my experience. God wants to use us, but that often requires us to give of our time, our gifts, our resources, even our, ooh, you're not supposed to say this church, money, and even our lifestyle preferences. That's even worse. Right down south, you go from preaching to Bedlam when you start talking about that. In contrast, the average Christian tends to look for much less. What will cost me less? What will mean less sacrifice for me, less change for me, less commitment for me? Here's what one speaker said. When God finds favor with us, it's because he wants to use us for his purposes. That almost always comes with some pretty significant demands on us. But more and more, when you're speaking of the American church, we want a less on us and more on God and others. We want the benefits without any cost. We want intimacy without commitment. We want to pay, we want to receive pay with little or no work. 
We want acclaim without work or achievement on our part. We want unlimited choices and limited consequences when we make them. We want likes without being likable. We want to be loved without loving. We want justice without judgment. We want heaven without heaven's king. We want to be obedient without being inconvenienced. Because it's about our schedule and our preferences. And first and foremost, it's about us. And that's not the example we get from Mary. I'm your servant, she says. She perseveres. She runs the race of life with God and God's will at the forefront and God's help in the process. And God blesses her. And us through her. She was hated. She was constantly on the run. She was embarrassed, confused. She didn't always understand what was going on. Sound anything like you? Ever had any of those things happen to you? And she watched her son die in a speakful death. And yet she saw the resurrection. God gives us glimpses of what is happening oftentimes without us knowing the whole story. And that's encouraging, but it's not always there. It's not required. When God uses us to complete his plans, it's for his glory, not our glory. And not for our ease and not for our enjoyment necessarily, though there is joy in it. Because as we begin to see God's work and we see those glimpses, we see that there is something useful about our lives. Do you really want to spend your life like the, the powers that be want you to be? To be that minion that all you do is go do what they tell you to do and then buy junk that they want you to buy and you repeat that process and in the meantime, you either dope yourself up with your television or your games or your drugs or whatever it is that you think of your choice and go, wow, I don't feel like anything's going on. I'm trying to fill a void that I'm just not feeling. Why do we have suicide rates amongst 10 year olds and teenagers the way they are? And 20 year olds? Because life looks futile. They look out and they go, you are not making a difference. My mom and dad's life sucks. This sucks. That sucks. I don't want a part of that. It's pretty sick, isn't it? So here's the challenge labor like we're loved. If we're loved mightily, labor mightily. And from 1 Corinthians, I appreciate Paul when he's writing this. By the grace of God, I am what I am. You're not trying to copy somebody else. God made you the way you are for a reason. And his grace towards me was not in vain. God did not make me in vain. And I'm not going to let the grace he's shown me that cares, that favor to be in vain. On the contrary, I'm going to work harder than any of them. Though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. So yeah, I'm going to do my very best, but it's really God working through me that makes the difference. So that's the challenge for us, isn't it? That's the challenge for all of us. To walk in favor of God is not to buy him off or to do some rituals or to feed some ministry. It's to do what God says to do as his servant. Yes, God. I'll go where you want me to go. I'll do what you want me to do. I'll lay down what you want me to lay down. And when God calls you, what will you say? What do most people say? Not now. Maybe later. It's inconvenient. I'm sure that's not you because I don't like what you're saying, right? Shannon kind of reminded me of a, a meme that we saw this week, and it was um, the reason most people don't, it's from Tozer, the reason most people don't hear God's, God's voice is because they've already made up their mind what God's plan is going to be, right? We have to be careful and be prepared to say, I am your servant. Like Isaiah, right, in 48, 6. Here I am, Lord, send me. Like Jesus. Jesus, Son of God, right, was there at creation. Is going to pay the price. Not my will, Father, but yours be done. Or Mary, I'm your servant. To be favored by God is to be used by God through his grace. Think about that. Take it to prayer. You know, if you want to rededicate yourself, let's pray afterwards. I'll tell you what, I had a real challenge this week. In fact, I had a bad attitude for part of the week because I was wrestling with all this stuff. You think it's bad, you only get preached once to. I have to be preached twice or three times to each week. So by me, through God. Jeez. But, you know, if you don't know Jesus, let's take care of that. If you do and want to be rededicated, let's take care of that. Take care of it today, whatever it is. There's always room to move closer to God. He's there. He can't get any closer to us, but we can get closer to Him. 
and to see that favor at work, even when it's hard, knowing that there's something valuable and powerful and good and eternal in it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the love that you show, for the care that you've given, for the truth that is there, Lord. It's hard for us to see because we get so bogged down in our stuff. But Lord, just like we saw today as we were praying earlier, there are many things that you're answering. Physical things, emotional things, spiritual things. And we thank you for that, Father. We thank you for those who are coming to know the Lord and those who are growing in the Lord and those who will. And I pray that you work in hearts and minds and spirits today, Father. Destroy the lies the enemies of souls have placed. Emphasize the truth and help us to know and grow in you, we pray. Thank you for your love and care, Father. Thank you for the time you've given us. May we use it well and may we say, I am your servant. Thank you, Lord. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. We're glad you can join us. You can reach us here for questions, comments, giving, what have you. In the meantime, we'll be praying for you. Will you pray for us?